right, we are at Book Expo America at the Javits Center in New York City, 2013. We're kicking off the show with the Naval Institute Press to, to honor our friends who are fighting for our freedom overseas, including uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Harry, who's uh, at a medical uh, hospital in Afghanistan, and for all the people that we've interviewed on the USS Wasp that have been on the show that were kind enough to lend their time with us on uh, Fleet Week in 2012. I am here with George Keating of the Naval Institute Press. There's a tremendously very cool display that they have, and they have a nice bunch of blow-ups. So let's walk over this way, and let's start with this book here, The A-Force, The Origins of British Deception During the Second World War by Whitney T. Bendek. Tell me about that book. Oh, Rich, uh, everyone is probably familiar with World War II, the build-up to uh, D-Day, the Normandy invasion, oh, yeah. the ghost armies that they created. Yeah, they blow up tanks. And, it all yeah. started uh, in the Egyptian campaign when the British needed to defend themselves against overwhelming odds. Uh, the A-Force group started in uh, Cairo and came up with a lot of the same tactics that were later employed uh, successfully for the battle of uh, the invasion of Normandy. Oh, so this is sort of the training. That's the training, and it's the, and it's the British group. They were, of course, very eccentric British types uh, that <laughs> came up with very successful methods of deception uh, that held off Rommel's Africa Corps as uh, they the were... The Desert Fox. The Desert Fox. Yes. They outfoxed the fox. Wow. Uh, and we have a lot of books on China. China's in the news. China's been in the news a lot lately, uh, yeah. Bernard Cole, his re most recent book is Asian Maritime Strategies. All those sailors on there are Chinese sailors. Uh, and there's, and a <laughs> there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Bud Cole's two previous editions of The Great Wall at Sea um, has been on the required reading list for the Navy. The, uh, and I'm sure that his new book, Maritime Strategies, I just want to grab the book here. This is this book is called The Great Wall at Sea, and they have some impressive-looking military equipment uh, depicted in the cover. And I know that there are allegations in the, the mainstream media that some of these designs came from us originally. <laughs> well, these are all... Um U.S. designs. No, no, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, they were um, they were originally U.S. designs that, that were the, emulated the, by the, the Chinese. Hacking yeah. just came to light, so probably does not cover these particular ships. Um, this book is the on, Asian Maritime Asian Strategies. Maritime, covers all the navies, the Japanese, Indian, um, as well as the Chinese, the Australian. So it really covers the Indo-Pacific okay. from the States of Hermes to the Aleutian Islands. Oh, wow. Okay, that's probably a very comprehensive book. Okay, moving along, because it's nice to the spread. We have new in paperback. This was published last year, uh, last fall. It's about the Aldrich Ames case. For those who don't know about Aldrich Ames, who was he and what did he do that was so Aldrich problematic? Aldrich was uh, a CIA agent, and he basically gave up our entire Eastern European and Soviet Union network of spies. Uh, what, year, what years was this? This was in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Okay. The two women who wrote the book were his colleagues. Sandra Grimes and Jeanette Verti Vertifuel. Vertify. Okay. Unfortunately, she died last year. Oh, that was Jean. Oh, too bad. But they were basically on the road to retirement and were called into duty one last time to see if they could locate the mole inside the, inside the CIA, and they determined that it was one of their colleagues, Aldrich James. Uh, the book is fascinating insider account of the CIA. It's also a very interesting account of two women who came up in the basically the madman world time period of the CIA and definitely hit the glass ceiling. But they broke through that ceiling by bringing to justice one of the great uh, traitors in American history. Wow. Uh, that sounds like a fascinating book. It's now in paperback. Uh, might possibly be made into a film. We have a lot of interest from Hollywood in it. Well, we, it was here first. Just remember that. <laughs> okay. uh, you mentioned Fleet Week. We yes. We kicked off Fleet Week last year with The Kissing Sailor. Uh, this is Alfred Eisenstadt's iconic photo. Uh, of the sailor and the nurse. She's actually not a nurse. 
She's a dental assistant. Ah. Uh, and, and apparently they didn't know each other before the picture. This is uh, George Mendonca, and this is his soon-to-be wife standing behind him. Wow. There was a lot of kissing going on spontaneously, and the book details uh, the discovery of who the actual participants are. Because well, so many people book. were kissing that day that a lot of people felt they were the ones in the photograph. Uh, but clearly, it's just these two individuals. And there's something about a man in a uniform. <laughs> uh, and they're both still alive. George oh, wow. Mendonca and uh, uh, Greta, sorry, forgetting her last name. That's, uh, that look, I, this this picture has been displayed, the, and uh, for the people who may not be able to visualize it, this is a U.S. Uh, sailor from the Navy uh, in Times Square celebrating the end of the war, and it was captured, I believe, most famously on Life magazine back in the day. Yes, and there was a second photo that many of the statues around the country have been built on. It was a Navy lieutenant took a similar photo but from an angle. Um, and his photo has been used to make a, a statue in San Diego and one in Florida. Wow. Because this is all copyrighted. Okay. Uh, Billy Mitchell. Yes. Your War with the Navy. War with the Navy. You might remember the great movie with Gary Cooper back in the 1940s. I remember Gary Cooper. I'm uh, old enough. <laughs> old enough. You look like you might be. I. Uh, Billy Mitchell came back from World War I convinced that uh, Air Force had uh, a future, had uh, risen to the point where they would replace navies and land armies in the wars of the future. He tried to uh, push for a Air Force to be created for all the different services. Navy, Marines, Army to be combined into one Air Force. That, of course, was an unpopular idea. It was even more unpopular after he showed that a plane could sink a battleship. Uh, when he didn't win uh, his point, he took it to the press and eventually angered the military powers that be uh, so that he was court-martialed for insubordination. However, one could argue that a large part of World War II was won because of air power, particularly oh, yeah. no, no in no the doubt. Pacific and in Europe. No doubt. And if you notice on the cover of the picture, you see a, a, a dual-wing plane right. from the old days, which shows you, right. you know. This was, I think, in 1933 that he conducted this experiment. Wow. Okay, the Liberty Incident Revealed. There have been many books out on the Liberty Incident, uh, June 6th. The Six Day War in 1967. Uh, there was a case of friendly fire. The Israeli Air Force mistakenly attacked the USS Liberty, did quite a bit of damage, which is clearly displayed on the cover. On the cover, uh, and to this day, it is still a matter of uh, great controversy as to whether or not this was premeditated, planned. Uh, act of collusion between our intelligence services and the Israelis to trigger uh, an even larger Middle East war to bring in the U.S. A lot of the same people who might be uh, speculating that the World Trade Center might have been organized by the same group. So uh, it is still uh, a matter of great controversy. The 40, author, 40, uh, AJ, 40 plus years later, Crystal. He is a federal judge. He's also uh, a Navy veteran. Uh, he published a book called The Liberty Incident. And at that time, it was hailed as one of the most definitive works on the subject. Uh, but at the time, uh, there were the tapes that the NSA, the National Security Agency, had of the Israeli Air Force hadn't been released. He's now obtained the tapes through the Freedom of Information Act. He's added six new chapters to his book. will be out in uh, September. Sometimes up to 2013. Right. We feel it'll be very controversial. Uh, Joe Rochford. Uh, this came out last year, or two years ago. It's now in paperback for the first time. Joe Rochford was um, the leader of Station Hypo in Hawaii. 
uh, and they were tasked with breaking the Japanese codes, which he is purple, group, right? Yep. His group successfully did forecast that the Japanese fleet would be off midway uh, and helped uh, the U.S. respond uh, with the depleted fleet they had uh, and with the element of surprise to deliver a resounding defeat to the Japanese in the Pacific and, and arguably won the war at that point. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the military channel has um, bios of Admiral Yamamoto and they, they talk extensively about how the code was broken. Um, I know that a, a lawyer friend of mine who's unfortunately now deceased was part of the team that broke the code. His name was Sam. Uh, he was part of the team. And my uncle, my uncle who's also unfortunately passed away, he was part of the wind, the wind talk, the wind walkers, the U.S. Marine Corps. And his job was to guard the chief. Um, he was in Guadalcanal in the Pacific, so I have sort of a little bit of a connection to all of this through relatives of mine who were in World War II. This looks like a fascinating book. At any rate, this won the um, Samuel Elliott Morrison Book of the Aw Book Award for Naval Literature. It won the John Lehman Book Award for Best Naval Biography. It won the Theodore and Franklin D. Roosevelt Naval History Prize, uh, the Farragut Book Award, and from our very own Proceedings Magazine. Uh, notable book of the year. Wow. So it is. Uh, Elliot Carlson is a journalist, uh, and this is his first book. So he really hit it out of the park. Let's talk about this one for a second. In the Shadow of Greatness Voices of Leadership, Sacrifice, and Service for America's Longest War. Tell me about this one. This is uh, a great success story uh, in publishing, and that the authors, there are four of them, they were members of the Naval Academy class 2002. Uh, they used a great deal of social media, partnered with veterans groups to publicize their book. Obviously, they're playing on the greatest generation uh, statement because they were uh, the first class to graduate after 9-11. And they entered the world um, to a different world. To a different yeah, world. much different world. And it's their experiences. Uh, some, it's a group of, it's a collection of stories by their classmates. Uh, we have a great quote from Tom Brokaw, Nathaniel Fick. Uh, and this was a very successful book last year. Um, and uh, we're showing it here again. It looks like a great book. It really does. Oh, by the way, good shout out to Ken List, my roommate from when I went to military summer school who was a graduate from Annapolis. So let's see. What else we have here? Uh, we have a terrific series that we've published for six years now. It's called Military Advantage. And it's a complete guide uh, for any veteran or active duty member to all of their benefits. Oh, that's going to be a great only, book, yeah. Not only their benefits, but the benefits that might accrue to their veteran, their, their, their family, uh, their survivors. Uh, it's written by Terry Howell. Uh, he is the editor for benefits for Military.com. Military.com is the largest uh, organization uh, for veterans and active duty. It's got over 10 million members. So it's revised every year. Uh, and... That's a must-have for any anybody in the military. Now, I remember there was one uh, book I wanted to talk about for a second, which was Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Yes. I want to end with that one, because that, that just seems like a great well, book. Rich, we just published this book, uh, and the subtitle tells it all here, because it's six characteristics of high-performance teams. When uh, Stockwell was in the Hanoi Hilton, He's the one who originated the, uh, the, that, the, the, the code, yeah, uh, and he really held those prisoners together. They banded together as a band of brothers. They were tightly organized, and he structured it so that the organization would continue without a leader, that everyone would abide by the principles of honor. Um, it was brilliant, actually. It was brilliant. And, and heroic. To get them through uh, this hor horrific experience. And uh, I don't know if you can see inscribed here. The power of we. The power of we and we are brothers. These were the mottos that they lived by. They were just 
two of the main characteristics that they embraced and that allowed them to survive. People don't realize how brutal the tortures and how repeated they were to the American POWs during the Vietnam era. Well, John McCain could barely stand uh, when he came back. Uh, and they were all severely malnourished. Uh, it's a remarkable feat that they, many of them have gone on to have very successful careers. And that was largely due to this um, organization they created for themselves. Now, did they learn these principles in their military training, or did they actually make this up on the go? Because I know it's taught now. I, they drew upon their military training, but I think it was uh, partly instinctual uh, in that through Stockwell's leadership, and uh, he distilled the things that they would need, that he felt they would need. They're the things that he tried to import in the groups that he directed during his military career. You have to you have to look at these people as sort of real American originals and, and truly unique and heroic people because I don't think a lot of ordinary people could have ever endured what they did. Absolutely, absolutely. Rich, the pleasure talking right, with. So wait, wait, last, wait, wait. wait, wait. If people want to go to a website or, or a phone number to you order any of these books? You can buy our books wherever books are sold. Okay. Um, all the like online little... retailers. And if they would like to be a member of the U.S. Naval Institute, they'd be eligible for uh, additional discounts. So there you go. Now what's your website? Our, our website uh, for the Institute yeah. is www.usni.org. Okay. The... Naval, the U.S. Naval Institute has, um, was founded in 1873 on the grain, grounds of the Naval Academy. Uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan was one of our uh, early leaders. And the whole purpose of the organization, it's a membership association, uh, is to uh, help the development of professional Naval Corps and to create a, an open forum for the discussion of maritime affairs. I look forward to seeing you next year to talk about next year's crop of books. Rich, thank you very much. I thank you. America. This is Richard Solomon. It is still day one, but we had so much material that we already filled up one show. So we're beginning show number two of Books, Book Expo at the Javits Center in New York City. And of course, I'm walking down the aisle. I'm on aisle 2900 for anyone who's um, at the show this week when we post this up on YouTube. Uh, it's a great body, no diet. I'm like, hey, that's for me. Now, I'm looking at somebody who's felt, all right? I'm looking at somebody who's felt, and I'm like the opposite of that. All right, and I'm not spelled. I guess I'm zothic, or, or as they say in, in Yiddish, I'm fat. <laughs> All right, so I have Rachel Zaydan. He's, she's wrote a, 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 a book called Great Body, No Diet, Practical Solutions for Reaching Your Ideal Weight and Maintaining It for Life. Well, I need that, and it's okay. It's okay. I, I'm admitting it. So, what can I learn from this book? Because I, I can see there's a lot of things, and I know that you address some of the things like I have my, I have no time, and I'm really busy, and um, I don't like water. You know, what are the so? Tell me, how am I, I going to combat all of those things? Well, um, you got to burn more than you eat. Okay, that's straightforward yeah, math. Formula. Straightforward. Exactly. So, so how do I do that when I love food and I'm not, and I, well, okay, I'm always sitting down somewhere. Food gives you energy. So if you take in less food, then you have less energy. But okay. you need energy to burn fat. Right. Right. But what about cravings and cravings snacks are, and you know? Uh, they come like at a certain time during the day, like 4 p.m. Like when it's you know, there's certain times during the day. You can have them occasionally. Why not? Because they also give you energy. Chocolate gives you energy and. Well, um, uh, sugar gives you energy. I, it's somewhat ironic that I noticed when I was passing by your booth that I was holding a bottle of water, but you guys are serving chocolate. 
<laughs> Even though I look like the way I do and you look like yeah. the way you do. <laughs> there's there's a lot of walking down here, so people needed that kick of energy at some point in the day. That's why we're offering you know a piece of chocolate if they want to. I eat whatever uh, you know I feel like. That's why I wrote the book because people kept asking me how come you eat burgers and you know you, you do you eat what you like and you're still looking slim. What do you do? So I documented what I do, and it works for others. So if you Water is very good um, before food and not after. Why? Because it, multi Why? Yeah. it multiplies the volume of the meal. Okay. Because, you know, when you eat, you get full. So that's your max. Then you take water over it. If it's bread, it multiplies. So don't have it before. Okay. Then, then you will eat. You will like the water better. You'll enjoy it because forcing water down is also not enjoyable. It's not. Yeah. 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 So if you have it before, then it helps dilute the meal. And when you dilute the meal, it leaves your body much more easily. Okay. Uh, because we're made of water, we're maybe 70% water in our brain, our lungs, our blood, or everywhere is water. Um, and you'll enjoy water more if you have it before a meal okay. or when you're thirsty. So what are some of the other practical solutions that would help sort of me and people like me to be more like you? Okay, so you eat a, a good healthy meal that has everything in it, and you eat and you get full, and you maybe eat a bit over your fullness, maybe four or five bites, but then you just forget about food for the next five to eight hours. Do your thing and drink lots of water during okay. that time. If you get hungry or you have low blood pressure, have a fruit, have a piece of chocolate, have a bit of almond, just to keep going. But don't uh, make your, like a good, healthy meal. Like like you fill up your car with the gas. You fill it up and then you use it, use it, and then you fill up again. You don't fill up every five minutes your car with gas, right? And your body is the vehicle of your soul. So this is how you drive your vehicle. You learn that when to drink, when not to drink, when to eat, how much to eat like that and you'll be able to do it to do it yourself later and you use um, there's a chapter here in this book on texture okay um, if you eat a dry meal like a pizza you should follow it by um, like a salad or a soup or something to balance if you keep eating dry food you'll you will block your digestive system I, I tend to do that uh-huh that's yeah. something you can work on easily yeah, I, I can eat things sort of like cereal bread you know because whatever because it's quick and easy so it, so why does that what is that what why, what is the problem with only eating dry food? It uh, blocks your system. Okay. Clog, clogs your system. A clogged sink, it stops working. Okay. You want your body just to keep functioning normally. Okay. So if you, if you, it's not like don't eat pizza. No. If you feel like pizza, have it, um, and then later on have something mushy. So dry and then mushy. Right. If you had, if you're gonna. Is it have mushy water, or wet? And more like yeah, like a water-rich okay. meal. Um, uh, if you feel like, uh, if you know, like you know what's coming in your life, because some, I mean, basically you cannot plan every single meal like diets do. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, like, life like is, yeah. We're at the Javits Center, so I didn't bring, I didn't really bring any food with me. So how how should I approach something like this today? I, I kind of ran out of the house. I didn't eat breakfast, which is, a, I know, a big no-no. It's okay, no. I'll you know? tell you next about that. Uh, but then I didn't really bring anything to eat or snack on, and now I'm sort of subject to the Javits Center food choices. Okay. You know, which could be chocolate and water. <laughs> well, yeah, chocolate and water until you get to your main meal, and then you have that, and you have, like... Um, you go and look for, at the menu downstairs. They have restaurants. So you look for something healthy. So you do 70% healthy and 30% unhealthy every month. Okay. And then you can do um, junk food 10% a month, for example. Okay. Not then, Don't overdo it with uh, those. But, okay. But how junky can you get? Like, is there, like, junk food like pretzels or junk food like... McDonald's? Like, like um, deep fried Oreos, <laughs> you know, like, like how junky can you go? Uh, you can do deep fried Oreos, but 10% a month. Okay. Yeah. And um, you can skip meals when, you, when you're not hungry. Okay. So don't force food if you're not asking for it, because you won't even enjoy the taste. Don't you enjoy food more when you're hungry? Oh, absolutely. And I, I do notice that, at least I'll speak for myself, I notice that I'll be more of a scheduled eater than a hunger eater, because it's sort of like, all right, I'm a trial attorney, the break is at one, that's when you have lunch. I mean, you're not being hungry, but that's sort of like the window, because you can't eat at 3.30 when you may be hungry, because you'll be in court, you know, and you can't say, judge, I, I need a snack. <laughs> you're smart about that question, because... That's the thing. You know what's coming your way. If you know you have a long drive, then eat a big meal, even if you're not hungry, because you know you don't want to stop every five minutes to get food or whatever. Okay. So that's why I say, like, you can't follow a certain diet every day, because every day is different. You don't know what's coming your way. So if you know that you have to be in court, then, yeah, eat. But if you don't, then don't. Like, if you know that, oh, I, I can reach food at any point I need to, so... Um, 
I don't have to like eat when I'm not hungry because then you store food. When you eat when you're not hungry, it stores. Is there? Do you have any particular favorite foods that you think are just either really great because they give you a lot of energy or they're just convenient and fun but still healthy? And and also, what are your guilty pleasures? Oh, uh, I saw a smile. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I, the, that's the, the stealthy um, deep fried Oreo question. <laughs> I haven't tried those actually. Where can I find them? <laughs> I've, I've seen, I've heard, I've heard about them. It's like you know, you've seen them at like um, state fairs and things like that. They'll I, fry anything. Yeah, I like. I mean, I, I kind of say like, don't do a lot of uh, deep fried. I like um, personally. I like uh, gourmet burgers. That's my favorite. Oh, yeah? like, I go to hotels and order like in the lobby or whatever. Um, now, when you say gourmet, like Kobe beef, or just you know, like a thick piece of meat, yeah. really thick, and uh, it should be like yeah, the good part of the beef. I don't really know the name exactly, but okay. with a yeah, bit of fat, like the ribeye, adds yeah. taste. Yeah. Um, and I like um, cakes, chocolate, whatever. I eat them occasionally. I don't eat it every day because then I don't enjoy it anymore. I like to wait for things because that's okay. that's when you enjoy it the most. And, um, okay. And what are your guilty pleasure, but guilty pleasure foods? Uh, I would say other than burgers and guilty pleasure. I don't. I, I try to think of food as uh, not not because guilty and guilty is like a feeling that that is not very nice. So I like to enjoy the pleasure and not think of it as guilt. Okay. I don't want to follow it with guilt. I, I want to follow it as oh, thank you, God, I had such a nice, yummy thing right now. You know. So in your book. Do you have any sort of like, uh, like a work worksheets or things to? How do you help people within the books maintain what you're advocating? How do you keep people? Because your title is and maintaining it for life. So. A lot of times people do things like, let's say they go to our oh, New Year's resolution, I'm going to go to the gym, and like for the first three months they go to the gym, and then rest of the year, you know. So how do you get people to sustain what they've started? Such a good question. There's a whole chapter on exercise, and I'm rebuilding the relationship between people and exercise because they don't like it anymore. Why? Because like you said, they go extreme, like they do five times a week and or three times a week, and it's so intense, and they're... They get exhausted from it, like it tires them. And I'm saying, no, don't do that. Go to the gym, do it twice a week. Twice a week, you can always manage. Once on the weekend and once during the week. Uh, do it uh, not so intense because, um, like, when you see people doing yoga, do you see them like uh, running and sweating? And you know, no, they're doing yoga and they're actually melting. Like I did yoga with a professional. He was like an Indian guru. He's really good yogi. Um, and I realized that you don't have to run and like explode your, your your heart from you know cardio. I do like three minutes of running in my whole workout. It's just that you. I could do that. Do, you need to do something like clean right. out, clean out every uh, once or twice a week. Maybe it's better twice, not, right. not once. Um, so once you rebuild your relationship with the gym, you'll do it for life because it's easy. Like it makes it easy for you. It makes it doable. It makes it realistic. Like, oh, I can always manage once or twice a week. And then you become more active. Like, you think I'm an active person now. Like, uh, my wife wants me to go to the car and pick up something for her because she forgot her her wallet. You know, I'll be like, no, I don't feel like going to get it. No, you'd be like, yeah, I am an active person. I'll go get it. Uh, I'll park far from the entrance. I'll walk. Take any opportunity where you have a bit of activity more and use that to burn. So that so that's what, what you're doing. You're saying I'm burning more than I eat. So I'm eating well, and then I'm burning it. So I use up all the energy in it, and then I come back and refill. And then I use up all the energy in it, and then I come back and refill. And once once people tell you like, you can eat sweets, it's okay, or occasionally, then you'll be you'll have the choice. So you'll be like, you know what? Maybe I'll have it later. You'll be able to say no to it. When I tell you no, you're not allowed to eat any chocolate. You're not allowed to eat any. Then you're like, oh, I want it. I want it. You're always constantly craving it. And it's normal to want sweets. I mean, they give us energy. Sugar gives us energy. Maybe not not to have too much of it, because then it goes the other way, and then it takes energy. Um, so it's kind of rebuilding uh, the relationship in every um, aspect, and the thoughts as well, like how you think of yourself, uh, what you think of your body, what you expect of your body. I mean, if you're thinking, I want to have my body the way it was when I was 14, 
no you cannot just let it go it's gone like you have to let go of things like we're, we're just here for a journey and it's we're gonna get out soon so you say okay I'll do the best of what I have now I don't I, I mean I would love to be like I was when I was 14 I had tight skin or whatever and full of energy but that's gone it's you know you let go like we grow up kind of thing you know well believe it or not you know since we actually really aren't what we used to be because all of our cells have been replaced. So theoretically, the person you were who was 14 has been replaced uh, several times, I'm sure. Uh, you know, So you really can't be what you were because because of just, just cellular aging. You know, I mean, exactly. everything's been replaced. Regenerate. You know? And if you accept that, um, then you'll be happy with what you have. If you keep saying, no, I wish I had what I had before, then you'll not be happy and you won't change. Once you accept yourself the way you are, you'll be able to change yourself. What, what are the biggest mistakes that people make in approaching food, dieting, and exercise? Okay, um, I would say the biggest mistake is drinking after a meal, okay. uh, expecting unrealistic results from sports, and then quitting. So not, not staying uh, disciplined about it and continuing it for life. And um, Is that because we live in sort of a... The information world where we expect a simple answer to a complicated problem in one minute because of a, a keyword database search and that, that we because we lost our patience I think as a society. We have in a way I was I was thinking how sometimes getting to a website becomes difficult and you're like I have to click two, three times. I'm like, well your finger is not gonna get tired <laughs> from clicking two, three times to get somewhere. It's okay. Uh, you're right, but we've managed to keep up with our own um, demand of how fast we want to become. So, is it is it also a problem that we? Is, you know? is it also a problem that you know generations ago people literally used their bodies? They, I don't know. They went places. They picked up things. They were more physical. They, you know, maybe they did gardening and you know for their own food. And now everything's sort of easy. You push buttons and things happen. And, and I think our overall level of activity has really changed. Is that How do you overcome that in sort of your philosophy and your book? I think that um, it's very true what you said. But also um, mind, uh, m like brain work, basically, it does burn energy. Studying, uh, anything that to do with work, when you use your brain, you're losing. But the unhealthy thing is just sitting down and not moving your body. So that's where you must do that extra effort. You know, get together with friends, do sports that you love all together. Don't just don't just uh, sit and, and wait and no. Couch potato is not a good <laughs> strategy. The other thing is try not to look into detail so much. You know, like oh, this has uh, and reading like labels and stuff. Look at the big picture. Okay, that's cool. one mistake that people shouldn't be doing. All right, so if you want, go to the web at greatbodynodiet.com, which is a great, great, great name. Uh, I see you're on the usual Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Plus. Um, the book is uh, Great Body No Diet by Rachel Zayden. And, uh, you know, she's at Book Expo, uh, aisle 2900, booth 2943. If you happen to be doing the show, the show is on until June 1st, yes, we're, uh, 2013, this Saturday. So if you're out there... Come Come on down. We're selling the book on the, to power readers on June 1st. If All right, great. They buy it. And, and, and they're giving out chocolate in case, you know, you weaken. <laughs> <laughs> either because either if you weaken or you want energy. So thank you for being thank on. You, All right, thank you so much. Lovely and meeting you. Same here. And hopefully I'll, I'll look at the book, and then next year at Book Expo, I'll be a little thinner. <laughs> you will. Yeah. I will. All right, there you go. All right. Guaranteed. We'll be right back. Richard Solomon taking care of business at Book Expo at the Javits Center. Now, when you walk through the aisles, you know, some things just catch your eye and other things you just walk by. So we're at aisle 2200. It's day one of the show. This is our second hour of recording show material, so it's action-packed. But when someone has the word term limits, you think, oh, that's a good thing because with politicians, you know, you need to change them like diapers, like as often as possible. So... <laughs> So I see term limits, and there's an evolutionary fix for marriage. 
So I have both Brad Brown and Dave Shields with me, which is kind of cool because these are the co-authors of the book. So, and I'm seeing here this is so like maybe the solution is so obvious that everyone just overlooked it. So, you, I, I mean, I'm just intrigued. So, from a marketing point of view, you guys are brilliant because you got the teaser, you got the sound bite, you got a good location, 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 location. That's right. You got it all covered. You got a very uh, cool graphic that really draws you in. So now I'm curious. Good. All right, so t- let's let's talk. So I don't know who wants to go first or whatever. Go ahead, All right. Dave. Okay. Well, a couple months ago, I got the bad news that my marriage was going to fail because my wife was having relationships that I didn't know about. And I called up my old friend and I said, "Man, I am so down. I don't know what to do." And I told him my sob story, and he listened. And then he said. Sorry to hear it. When you're ready for the solution, you let me know. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? And then he told me this amazing story. He had, he had developed this. I will let Brad give you a little right, so, bit of teaser on it. Right, so we're transitioning now. Okay. Okay, so Brad Brown. So, all right. So we're sitting down, and we're having a beer, and we're talking. He's telling me his, abs, his, his, his uh, tale of woe. Yeah, his sad <laughs> sob, sob story. Anyway. A cue we, violin music? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get done with that, and uh, I just said, you know, Dave, there's some things we ought to look at here. And uh, so I, I developed this idea and had written it into a thesis. I gave it to him. He read it, called me back three days later, says, we need to write this into a book. And it basically is a way of looking at things differently to achieve a better outcome, to achieve a more long-lasting outcome by making the term and the responsibility short. So you look at the... Is this like transparency in government? (laughs) It could be, absolutely. Well, no, hey, you brought up the point that the officials get elected and we need to change their terms every so often to keep them honest, right? Well, I need to look at the, you know, relationship in the same way. If I'm working at it and she's working at it and everything's good, then we renew our term. So this sounds like permanent options. (laughs) It is. It's permanent options, but with a twist. You're going to want to renew because, you know what, if you're getting what you want, she's getting what she wants, you're both going to be happier. You're going to want to stay in that relationship, and i.e., you're going to want to renew. On the other side of it, if you know you have responsibilities and there's consequences, and you're not going to get any alimony, child support, or anything else out of it, it's just going to be a separation and an ending in that agreement, you know, those consequences, you better probably do your end of the deal if you want to make sure you get a renewal. So it sounds like carrot and stick. <laughs> carrot and stick. <laughs> right? It sounds you like carrot. a little bit of both. <laughs> now, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll share your story. Um, way back when in college, I took a course called Family Law. And the professor told us this incredible story about a couple that would get married every year. And at the end of the year, they would get divorced for tax purposes. So they'd be married and divorced and remarried and so on. And then what happened was one of the two people, when it came time for the remarriage part, said, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're we're good. And like, wait, wait, what do you mean we're good? Like, I'm good. We're we're done. And, you know. They were an early innovator. (laughs) So so in a sense, even though I haven't remembered that from way back when, it sounds like that was kind of a parallel to this. It is. But there's more to it than that. Oh, no, no, of course. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. I, obviously, that's not a book, and this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So, so, what is, so who is the book written for? The to be married, the currently married, everybody? All the above. People who do marriage counseling? All the above. You know what? If, if you read this, you'll find a lot of, uh, you know, relevant information in your own life, in your own relationship, no matter what stage you're in. The people it's not written for, it's not a dating book. It's not how to go out and find yourself a date. It's for some. It's for people that have already found the person they want to be with, or think they want to be with, or already are with. It's not for how to go find somebody in a shopping mall or at the grocery store, or, you know, at a bar. It's about people that already think they've found the one they want to be with. I got to switch over to Dave for a second. All right. Okay. All right. So, you now that you wrote the book. What have you applied of the book lessons to your personal life? Well, in my personal life, as I said, I'm going through a divorce, which, which uh, very much hampers trying to create a new relationship. But I've had the, the opportunity to work with lots of people and uh, really reevaluate what my next relationship is going to be like because it's very important to me to be in a quality relationship. And I've had conversations with women about you know, some of these ideas, and they said, wow. 
I can't believe the honesty. And you know what? The idea of of you making a promise that this is what you're going to deliver, and I make a promise that that's what I'm going to deliver, that really is an appealing relationship. Yeah, but i got to ask the question. Remember the movie where, um, I think it was Mel Gibson who... Aside from his political problems and whatever, and his anger issues, yeah. uh, was able to read women's minds, yeah. and yeah, then yeah. was able to kind of basically give them what they want because yeah, they were yeah. thinking, you know, hey, I would love an apple pie right now, and they'd be thinking that. And of course, he'd yeah, come yeah. out with a big apple pie, and they're like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> so the question is, even though you say you're refreshingly honest, is it being received as fresh innovation, or is it? the problem that everything's so ingrained and entrenched that it's all theater no matter what when you're out there I don't think so if it's both if both people are stripped down to that core if you're both in the in the same honesty stage and you're both giving vulnerable information and expecting to get back what you express that you need while delivering the same things that that person needs I think it's pretty honest. I think it's pretty straightforward. Right, but it's, like where where reading someone's mind is a violation, you know, a violation of their privacy in a way. That's why it bothered those women. This isn't about reading your mind. As a matter of fact, this is about making it known. You got to communicate everything to me. You can't assume that I know anything that you didn't tell me. So we have honest conversations. I do. I behave in the ways that you, the ways that I'm willing to behave, the things that you need, because you told me that that's what you need. And because I love you. That's, you know, it's a powerful way of creating a relationship. So let me ask the question. It seems to me like in the older days, like the greatest generation people, that they had that. And somehow that eroded to something that's much more... Evolved. No, devolved. It devolved. Because it, I think people are a little bit more shallow, a little bit more less committed, a little bit more idealistic, you, you presumptive. Know, I, I think that that's the general perception, but I disagree with it. Is, okay, that's fine. This is radio. I absolutely disagree. I think that the, there's people out there that want to have good, solid relationships, and they haven't been taught how. And honestly, I don't think that the role models out there have been as good as they were in the past. And I don't okay. think the commitments to each other and the honesty has been there as much. So I think you have a little bit of a dichotomy where you look like one thing, but reality is over here, people are fed up with the institution. It's not working. We need to fix it. But why did it break down? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and I don't want to get into no, all no, of just, those. No, it's just like one or two sound bites. You know. I, I think, honestly, as a society, we had a lot of changes back in the 70s. If you look at the spike of when all this stuff happened, when all the divorces started going on and separations, you know, it came after uh, more freedoms of thought and came after more free ways of uh, thinking, and yet marriage stayed the same. Marriage had the same traditional things. And in fact, the way they fixed it, they didn't do anything to, to strengthen the education of two people getting married. It gave us no fault divorce. Well, you know, I mean, hello. Well, you know what's kind of interesting? You know, I'm a lawyer. And what's interesting, <laughs> what's interesting, I don't do divorce work, but what I, what I do find interesting is this. It's almost a snap of a finger to get married. Yeah. You know, you sign a, like a license because all the government wants is a fee, so it's a tax. So they just want a little tax fee to get married. And then you get married, all right? But to get divorced, right, you got to go through well, and a married? minefield of problems, litigation, costs, experts, forensics, all this other stuff. So it, it seems like wouldn't it be better to do it the other way, which is the threshold to getting married Tough. should have be a little bit And then if bit, you guys yeah. don't want to be together anymore, you agree not to? Okay, right. but here's the thing. You go out there and get married, like you said, it's easy. But the only way you get out of it, you got two options. Die or go through the hell of a divorce. And that's it. I thought there's actually a third. There's actually a third. I'll tell you what it was. And I heard about this. There's a guy, somebody I know told me about this. Guy went to um, Brazil for like carnival. And he went down for some kind of trade show. And no, no. Oh. And what happened was he literally hung out, had a great time. And 
sent like a note back that said, I'm not coming back. And that was it. He gave up everything. He gave up everything. So His okay. friends. Leave your world behind. <laughs> All right. He just gave, he just burnt everything. No one ever heard from him again. That was it. Started a new life. And, you know, boom. So that's exactly the story. But that's, that's really bold. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit. In a, in a term limits marriage, not only do you define what it is that you need from one another, you also define what how the uh, marriage would be dissolved at the end of that term. Now, you're not necessarily going to, you know, you might renew, but unlike a normal divorce where you hire lawyers at the point where you can't even speak to your former lover and it costs you $15,000 a piece to get this thing over with, you've already written it into a contract when you were in love, and if it falls apart, it's too bad, but at least you don't have to go through that misery of hiring divorce lawyers. But you know what must be interesting? When the last six months of the contract is running, yeah. just like in real estate, when the lease is up and the landlord wants to sit down for the talk, <laughs> and that's when, like, you know, everybody, the knives and pencils get all sharp, yeah. you, know? Yep. Yeah. you know? It's got to be very interesting because either what you see is... Or like a politician running for re-election. Right, right. All of a sudden, they clean up their yeah. act. Look what I did for you. Yeah. Right? Where were you, like, the last three and a half years? Yeah. Nowhere. <laughs> so, right. so the question is, does it get... I guess I guess it depends on the people, but I guess some people get very good and some people just run the clock down. Yeah, but think about this. What if you just got married and you didn't have that coming up? You're not going to get anything. Either way, they're either going to do the same thing or even worse, they're just going to go, huh, I'm married for life. I don't need to do anything more because guess what? It doesn't matter. The only way you're getting rid of me is death or divorce. So you have a term that says, like you said, and the, after one or so many times, the one guy just goes, hey, I'm good. <laughs> you know, that's what you got to be thinking in the back of your mind. You know, is she looking at me going, OK, I'm good. So so to, to kind of put all this in perspective, how do we get people to change their way of thinking other than reading your book, which they should? You Talking. Know? Talking. All right. Communication. Talking. You got to tell people what you want. I mean, you know what? There are people out there, and I don't believe that it has to be any big mumbo-jumbo thing. It's just simply, you know what? I'm going to tell you what I want, and you're going to tell me what you want. We're going to see if we can work that out and deliver both of those things and be honest about it so that communication is real. Lay down a blueprint, a foundation for moving forward, and then we got something instead of that. Well, I said I'd do it at the altar, and I have no idea what I do, too, you know, what I did. Let me, let me ask you one important question. You know, as, as people who are not 20, uh-huh. you know, I thought I knew some stuff at 20. Now that I'm much older, I know I knew nothing exactly. <laughs> when I was 20. So if I was going to get married at 20, I, I wouldn't even know how to do any of this stuff right. that you're talking about because I didn't live enough life to really know. Absolutely. What That's the, why you set a short-term contract. You, you know that you need some things you're going to develop, but, you know, so set, set a two-year contract. Meet those expectations for two years. Learn what other things you need. And then renegotiate. Into, yeah, and renegotiate. You're renegotiate it. And look at it this way. Contract. If it doesn't work out, you're better off for it. Rather than going through a life-altering divorce in order to get out of this thing where you're going to be paying alimony. Plus the collateral going, damage to children and relatives. And, and yeah. you know what? If people say, oh, well, this is going to be bad on kids, let me just tell you something. Nobody cares anyway what they're doing. This is going to be good for kids. And what people are doing right now is getting married with these long contracts, having kids, and two years later, they're divorced. You know, they need to think a little bit more about, hey, are we really compatible? Are we really going to be good parents together? And that's probably a little bit of thought going in that direction is probably go a long way in preventing a lot of problems down the road. So where is there a website for? Yes, sir. I, so what's the what is it? It's termlimitsmarriage.com. Okay, there you go. And any any other words or words of wisdom or any appearances coming up? Oh, you know, movie, yeah, movie yeah. stuff. <laughs> you you know, know, literary what, agents come up and say the movies, but I don't see it. Anyway. I, I just oh, remember, well, look, the rules was gigantic, and then the code was gigantic. Yeah. So this is sort of like, you know, part of that <laughs> trilogy. So to never speak. say never. You know? Well, I, I would just say this. I really encourage people to read the book and give me some feedback. I like the feedback. I like to hear this, you know, banter back and forth. This isn't about religion or politics, and there's it's non-denominational. There's no racism in it. There's This is about the truth, the two people 
no matter what gender can have between each other and the communication they can establish between each other, set down some guidelines and have a better experience than what we're having now. And who knows? Maybe that experience will renew over and over and over again and become a lifetime marriage. So that's what we're doing. There you go. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, your wisdom, and uh, good luck with the book. Thank you very much, Richard. All right. Thanks, guys.